we left off on Wednesday, we were um, starting in, uh, okay, we were starting in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38. Things are happening so fast and so furious until, um, man, I had to adjust um, something in our lesson tonight because of things that are happening in our world since we talked on Wednesday. So um, I don't know if you've been watching the news but the UN General Council is meeting in New York. This is something they do every year. And most of the, uh, the uh, leaders um, speak from different countries. I don't know how they decide who's going to speak. But um, so President Netanyahu uh, from Israel uh, was one of the speakers. I'm going to play you a clip of what happened. You might have seen it, but some might not have seen it. Um, first, they had a vote. I think I talked about that on Wednesday, uh, that 154 countries voted against uh, Israel's uh, war, you know, and, you know, continuing to help Israel. And uh, I believe 43 countries voted um, to stay with them and to help them, including the United States. And that's kind of, you know, iffy right there. But uh, anyway, so uh, this was the day that Netanyahu actually spoke there. And so I'm going to play you a clip of what happened. We help individuals and organizations better lead and manage change, and now we're excited to offer the Carter of the Assembly. I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Benjamin Netanyahu. Prime Minister of the State of Israel. I request protocol to escort His Excellency and invite him to address the assembly. Order, please. Ladies and gentlemen, order. Order, please. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't intend to come here this year. My country is at war, fighting for its life. But after I heard the lies and slanders leveled at my country by many of the speakers at this podium, I decided to come here and set the record straight. I decided to come here to speak for my people, to speak for my country, to speak for the truth. And here's the truth. Israel seeks peace. Israel yearns for peace. Israel has made peace and will make peace again. Yet we face savage enemies who seek our annihilation 
and we must defend ourselves against these savage murderers. Our enemies seek not only to destroy us, they seek to destroy our common civilization and return all of us to a dark age of tyranny and terror. When I spoke here last year, I said we faced the same timeless choice that Moses put before the people of Israel thousands of years ago. As we were about to enter the Promised Land, Moses told us that our actions will determine whether we bequeath to future generations a blessing or a curse. And that is the choice we face today. The curse of Iran's unremitting aggression or the blessing of a historic reconciliation between Arab and Jew. In the days that followed that speech, the blessing I spoke of came into sharper focus. A normalization deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel seemed closer than ever. But then came the curse of October 7th. Thousands of Iranian-backed Hamas terrorists from Gaza burst into Israel in pickup trucks, on motorcycles, and they committed unimaginable atrocities. They savagely murdered 1,200 people. They raped and mutilated women. They beheaded men. They burned babies alive. They burnt entire families alive, babies, children, parents, grandparents, in scenes reminiscent of the Nazi Holocaust. Hamas kidnapped 251 people from dozens of different countries, dragging them into the dungeons of Gaza. Israel has brought home 154 of these hostages, including 117 who returned alive. I want to assure you, we will not rest until the remaining hostages are brought home too. And some of their family members are here with us today. I ask you to stand up. With us, with us is Eli Stevie, whose son Idan was abducted from the Nova Music Festival. That was his crime. A music festival. Okay, I'm going to stop it right there. Uh, the speech went on for a little while longer, but as you can see, the, um, at the very beginning, they, the people walked out. I request protocol to escort His Excellency and invite him to address the assembly. Order, please. Ladies and gentlemen, order. Those are the countries that hate God, basically. Because when you turn your back on Israel, the Bible says you're turning your back on him. So that's what happened today. Now, also what happened today, as Netanyahu was speaking, um, back home, they were attacking Hezbollah uh, strongholds, and uh, they believed that, I, I think I had mentioned Hassan uh, uh, Hasrallah, who is the head of Hamas, uh, I'm sorry, head of um, Hezbollah, and uh, they've been trying to get him. So I think that they actually got him. I'm going to play a little bit of this uh, one podcaster that we watch that really digs in. Um, now today, September the 27th, 2024, it appears Hezbollah, the enemy of Israel, has been destroyed and maybe completely eliminated. Now you can see here the chain of command for the Hezbollah terrorist organization, and you can see they have all been eliminated in all the attacks that have been unfolding over the past week or so. And take a look at the top here, Hassan Nasrallah, we are hearing 
that he could have been eliminated today in an attack that unfolded while Benjamin Netanyahu was speaking at the UN that they had hit the headquarters in Beirut and it is believed that they have eliminated Hassan Nasrallah. Now it has not been confirmed, but we're hearing the attack that took place while uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was speaking at the UN was massive. And there are rumors that uh, Hassan Nasrallah's uh, daughter was hit. There is rumors circulating around there. Now, again, this has not yet been confirmed, but if so, this is huge. It would literally mean that Hezbollah has been completely eradicated, removed from Lebanon, and eliminated. Israel has successfully done this, and the United States has been begging for peace, a ceasefire, and we're hearing that they are just shocked because they have been pushing for there to be some sort of diplomatic solution. We heard it had gone beyond the point of return and that the United States was just hoping that maybe uh, Israel would hit Hezbollah so hard that they would come to some sort of an agreement. But now we're hearing there could be full and complete elimination of Hezbollah now. This is huge breaking news coming out and it unfolded while Benjamin Netanyahu was speaking at the UN. We're hearing that moments before he went on to speak before the UN, they had approved the attack and the hit to get them while he was speaking. Uh, now I'm going to be sharing with you the video footage coming out from Fox News so that way you can see it for yourself. Uh, and in addition to that, take a look at these headlines coming out, you guys. Israel says that it struck Hezbollah's headquarters as huge explosions rocked Beirut. There's video footage and uh, photos coming out all over social media. Earlier today, Hebrew media is now reporting growing Israeli assessment that Nasrallah, he has been eliminated in Beirut. And uh, again, not confirmed. We're hearing back and forth that he could be alive, he could not be alive. Um, but this coming out today, September the 27th. Now, once we have confirmation for sure, I will let you know, because if he is no longer alive, it means Hezbollah as a whole is pretty much eliminated. Now, Iran, though, is having a emergency meeting as a result of what's unfolding. Middle East Crisis Live, Iran says Israeli strike in Beirut now changes the rules of the game as Israel braces for potential retaliation as a result of what has unfolded. Israel says that it carried out multiple strikes on Hezbollah's main military headquarters in Beirut suburbs. Nasrallah's condition is unclear. Like, again, as I'm telling you, they're not sure if he has been completely eliminated or if he uh, is alive. We're hearing that he was in the headquarters so the question is, is he alive and injured or has he been eliminated? Now, this comes as, as I mentioned, Iran, they're saying, is meeting, discussing what the next steps are. Take a look at this. Netanyahu, at that UN speech, addressed Iran directly and said, if you strike us, we will strike you. Now, keep in mind that while he was giving this speech, he knew that the orders had already been issued for them to strike Beirut and to try to eliminate Hezbollah. And he said, with respect to Hezbollah, he charged that it was the quintessential terror organization of the world or in the world. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I just wanted to catch you up with what went on just today at the UN uh, with Netanyahu's speech where they disrespectfully got up uh, in mass and walked out as he was talking and then also what was going on uh, at the same time. So it's, it's getting very serious. And you know that Iran uh, will probably plan some type of a retaliation, you know, but um, God is on their side. And um, God is always going to protect Israel. So you can count on that. Any questions or comments? Or did anyone see that or hear about that today? I didn't see it. Okay, you didn't see it. Okay, I did. I, but I, I'm. It's the first part of his uh, the speech. It's a speech, and I also saw where the AD it hit uh, Hezbollah. Okay, Lebanon. Uh, where right. is Hezbollah? Uh, In Beirut. 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 Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's where the headquarters uh, for Nas uh, Hassan Nasrallah. He's the he's the one that you see the older guy. Well, he's really not that old. They say he's really aged since this. Uh, he's in his 60s. Uh, I thought he was older than that, but they said he's really aged over the last couple of years with all of this going on. So 
But anyway, they think they might have got, you know, got him. They destroyed six buildings uh, where he is known to uh, have his offices and his uh, his residence and places like that. And uh, they are flattened. So unless he was out of the country or somewhere else, he's in that building. So we'll see. We'll see. But I wanted to, you know, to get you kind of caught up on that. Uh, any any questions on that at all? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, continue in... Um, I'll turn that down. Uh, okay. Let me... So this will be part two. Why? Okay, if you guys can uh, put your mute on, please. Okay, so this will be part two of our study of uh, Ezekiel 38, 39. And these two chapters speak of how the enemies of Israel gather to attack what they think is a defenseless Israel. Isn't it, isn't it strange that we're looking at things, you know, we're looking at prophecy happening? You know what I mean? Uh, this is what we know and call the War of Armageddon, uh, which is the final war which precedes, I have to move this thing out of my way, which precedes the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Ezekiel 38, 39 speaks of this final war uh, with the enemies of God. Now, let me skip forward to the new stuff. Now today's... Okay. So we're going to start uh, in verses 14 through 23. Pastor Sam, you want to read that, please? Pastor Sam, are you there? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. God's judgment and intervention. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel well, safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you, and all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. Okay, we're going to stop there. Look at um, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, we're going to look at break. 15 down a little bit where, uh -huh. yeah where um it says then you will come from your place out of poor north we determined that was will probably uh be magog which is uh russia uh you and many people with you all of them riding on horses and great company and mighty army um ezekiel's prophecy of course he was seeing things that he knew of you know, see cars and tanks and things that we have now. So that's uh, why you see horses and things like that. He was seeing the vision, uh, the prophecy based on things that uh, he was familiar with, if that makes sense. Well, so, 14, uh, can, I come, can I come in on 14? Because it said when Israel is dwelling in safety, because we know it ain't going to happen now with, with the war going on. Because they're right. in great harm right now. So it's going to be after, you know. The War of Armageddon, right. Right. For, uh, for the War of Armageddon will be after this war that we're having now, which some people refer to as the Great North free War. war. The free it's war. over, yeah. and Israel is dwelling in safety. Thinking that they're the right. safety. And the end of they are the... mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so uh, verse 15, uh, the backdrop of this prophecy emphasizes the sovereignty of God, first of all, who not only allows adversities, but he orchestrates him to reveal his might and holiness to the nations. Uh, the depiction serves to remind us that apparent security can often precede challenges designed to affirm God's dominion. So sometimes it, you know, when things uh, look just really secure and safe and everything, um, 
and that things can proceed, you know, challenges can come uh, that God has actually allowed or designed. Uh, throughout history, we see God as he confronts his enemies. Uh, he magnifies his name and power and thus educating nations about his ultimate authority. Um, the enemy thinks, sees an opportunity as a people are living in peace. The land is unwalled, no bars, no gates, you know, so, uh, you know, they can just, they think they can just go in there and take over. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Pastor Sam. I just want to get that. Verse 16, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I when I am power in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I will bring you against them? Okay, let me just, uh, uh, the bold print that I have, I will bring you against my land, I. God is saying this is a prophecy of God through uh, Ezekiel. He's telling them, I will bring you against my land. This is something that God is orchestrating. So that, you know, for what reason? So that the nations may know me. So they, after this, and we know that uh, the, is, uh, pe the Hebrews will be offered that uh, final um, decision to accept Jesus Christ at the end. And he's hoping that uh, that they will accept Jesus Christ at the end. We talked a little bit about that before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so God uh, is very impressed with the wealth of Israel, which draws them into battle. Yeah, we can go back to 12. Well, let's see if I can go back there. Okay, 12, uh, to take plunder and to take booty. That means uh, all of the goods and things that they have. To uh, uh, stretch out your hand against the wasteland, waste places that are, uh, again, inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land. All of that is talking about the wealth of Israel. Israel is, as small as it is, it's one of the wealthiest places in the world. It's one of the most uh, technical, is that a good word? Tech, techno, technological places, advancements, um, a lot of things that we see in the world today came from uh, great brains of people in Israel, great, um, you know, designers and builders, architects, uh, farmers. They, they made the desert boom. You know, they figured out a way. This is a desert, right? And so deserts don't have green stuff. But Israel does. And they're teaching other people around the world how to have green stuff as, as well. They've overcome the dry desert land by technology, by things that they do. Pastor Sam, I know a little bit about that. Uh, we talked a little bit, or the, our guide talked a little bit about how they have overcome some of the... Uh, uh, the dryness of the land. They didn't have water. They figured out a way to bring water from the Mediterranean, is it the Mediterranean, uh, into the land of Israel. And everywhere you look, you see like these, un uh, some of them are, are on top of the ground and some are kind of under the ground, but you can see the, the pipes 
they have these lines running all over Israel. But then in the farmland, it's even more uh, extravagant. The way that they have figured out how to bring water to the soil to grow their vegetables. And when you go to their markets, all you see are these big, giant, giant apples and oranges and heads of lettuce and all kind of fruits and vegetables and things like that. And uh, like that's basically all they eat. That's, uh, they, they eat chicken and they eat uh, uh, turkey, probably. Of course, they don't eat pork. Um, but mostly they eat uh, fruits and vegetables. Lots of lambs and goat. Yeah, lamb and goat. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. They sure do. And uh, but uh, they just, you know, you can find they have vegetable stands all over the place everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. So and it is a amazing how they have overcome uh, the dryness of the desert to make the desert bloom, mm -hmm. and that was prophesied too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Make the desert bloom, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go on. Okay, I finished that. Did I finish this? Okay, God is very impressed with the wealth of Israel. Okay, and I showed you verse 12 again. We are told that Israel is uh, considered the center of the world in this verse. It certainly lies at the center of uh, the Bible's geography, and it is the focus of the Christian's world. Today, we would say China or the US, or maybe the EU, the uh, European Union, lies at the center of the world in terms of power, wealth, and attention. But in the kingdom, the Bible says it's Israel. Israel is, by all definitions, the center of the world. Little Israel. That country just amazes me on some so many levels. Okay, let's go on past the same. Judgment on God. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth, shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against God throughout all of my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. We read about that happening before. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on many people who who are one second, please. Pop up on my screen. One one I will rain down on many people who are following him, floods of rain, great hailstone, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations then they will know that I am the Lord. Amen. Don't okay. mess with God's people. <laughs> so uh, God foretells that when God um, attacks Israel, his anger will rise, causing uh -huh. earthquakes and chaos among God's forces. And God declares that he will execute judgment upon God with plagues and bloodshed and all of that kind of stuff we just read, showing his greatness and holiness before the eyes of many nations. With a coalition army surrounding Israel and with no hope in sight for the nation of Israel, Yahweh, the God of Israel, will act. 
And though the enemy will cover the land like a storm and with certain uh, victory within its grasp, they shall come to the same fate that the Egyptians ex experienced when uh, when the close when the closed in when they closed in on Israel at the Red Sea on the what I think I meant they right they as the scripture around the Egyptian right. soldiers yes as the as the scripture says behold he who keeps Israel will neither what slumber mm -hmm. nor sleep so just like the Egyptians Pharaoh's army we know the story they're in uh. Magog, Gog and Magog, their end will be basically the same. Yes. Basically the same. And you have the soldiers, I like that one, you have the soldiers turn against each other mm -hmm. and start killing each other. All right. The soldiers from uh, Egypt, Russia, China, whoever soldiers, Iran, all the soldiers that will be on Israeli soil then, we saw that ever when we was in Israel, the Battle of Armageddon yep. area. Remember, we looked over that hill. Yep. And that Where was such it? a sight to see it. That's my imagination was just thinking about that battle when I was looking over there, and you could see the soldiers get confused, like when uh, I think it was Gideon, another couple other wars. Yeah. When God had them do that. A couple of times that happened. Yes. And um, so you can kind of get an idea of the coalition from even today. All of those nations, all of those people that walked out of that UN meeting yes. um, are enemies of Israel and basically enemies of the U.S. For mm -hmm. the life of me, I think I said this Wednesday, I cannot understand why they are still in the UN, especially the United States. The United States puts more money for the upkeep and everything, that, the building at the UN in New York and everything. They put more money into that and gets very little respect at all. And, and, and that should have sealed it today. That really should have sealed it. The, they're, showing, they're telling you that we are your enemies. We're turning our backs on you. We're walking out of your speech. We don't want to hear what you have to say. We don't care about you. We are on the side of that took 1,200 of your people who were sleeping in their beds and killed a bunch of them, beheaded a bunch of them, killed children, old people. They didn't care. Drug them away. Yeah. More than 200 and so uh, in uh, uh, as hostages. They've been killed about half of them already. Uh, and was that you, Pat, or Joyce? Who Me, <clears throat> Joyce. Okay. <clears throat> I was wondering, because I remember I told you I didn't hear the first part of uh, the speech, mm -hmm. but uh, while he was speaking, they kept showing uh, I ran the places where Iran was supposed to sit and the place where Saudi Arabia and it was all empty and I'm going why why, why are those um, there's nobody in there you know and yeah. now I didn't know that that they had got up and walked out yeah I didn't know that when they yeah when they uh, called him up there and uh, the person walked him out they got up it was orchestrated yeah, mm -hmm. I, I didn't see that part. And that's the part I missed that because uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering why, and they kept showing it. Um, um, what was, I, was, I was listening to, I think, CBN. CBN. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was orchestrated because uh, Pastor Sam noticed, he said, look at all of them. They're getting up and they're going towards the back. They want to make a statement. And we're walking out together. They didn't go like at different doors out different ways. They got up and they did it together. They wanted in, like, they wanted to interrupt his entrance when he came on. Uh, the right. moderator kept trying to get order. It's supposed to be order all the time, and they wouldn't even pay the moderator any attention. 
Now, if you, that's a good statement you made, Pastor Yvonne. After you find out what countries have got up and walked out of the office, then you have all the countries of the nation is that's going to be attacked. Well, what we know that's probably the 154 that voted again the other day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's probably who it was. I'm sure they'll you know, some kind of list of who they were will come out, but it it's probably mm -hmm. going to be the same ones that voted against in that vote that we talked about on Wednesday. Yeah, well, that was a bold statement today to get up and interrupt the United Nations oh, meetings yeah. that very get up and walk statement. out, you know, going to meet them. You know. Right, that, and yeah, that was very disrespectful. But there's one thing you can say about uh, Israel's leadership. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, he does not bow to anybody. Exactly. He, he is his own man. Uh, he is determined. He's not soft. He doesn't waver. He's on a mission. His mission is to get those people back if they're still alive. But, he, you know, he's going to make sure that he gives it his all. You know, he owe, he says, I owe it to their, their families. So he's like determined. And so, uh, he, of course, he noticed them getting up. But it didn't. And he might have even expected it. He knew how the vote went the other day. Even if they sat there, he, they probably would have, you know, did something hateful, like roll their eyes or, you know, something to let him know that uh, we don't like you. But anyway, it, it you know, and I respect a leader like that. I respect a leader like that who doesn't change with the, you know, how the wind blows or what somebody else says. He's determined. He knows what he has to do. And he's determined to do it, no matter who's on his side. Because he knows one thing. He knows that God is on his side. So that's good enough for him. That's good enough for me. <laughs> Any questions or comments? I just wanted to say, in spite of all of those people getting up and walking out, this man, I admire him too, because he's, like you said, he stands strong. He is a strong man. And in mm -hmm. spite of them walking out, he still um, made his statements. He got his his saying out, and he said, "I am here to set the record straight." His voice is even strong, mm -hmm. so he didn't let any of that. Um, I don't think attack his heart in any kind of way. He wanted to hear, make himself known, and that's what he did. In spite of those crazy people getting up and walking out. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right. So, uh, still talking about that section we we read. Ezekiel foresaw four different ways by which the invading Magog army will be defeated. A great earthquake will hit the land. Panic will seize the invading armies, and every man's sword will be against his brother. We just talked about that. Pestilence will break out upon the invading armies. And finally, fire, brimstone, and hail will rain down upon them from on high. The result of this supernatural destruction of the invading army will be so amazing that people will be left with no other explanation but that the God of Israel has done this. An earthquake doesn't normally occur right at the very point when an army is about to attack another one, another. Fire and brimstone doesn't just fall from the sky. Hell big enough to kill a man doesn't just rain down at such a strategic time as this. No, these things are no coincidence. There are no coincidence in his kingdom. It's orchestrated by God. That's why I say we all we, we got to be on the right side of history and the right side with God. Oh, 
but they occur because a heavenly being has decreed them to occur. Even the nations watching on to see the destruction of Israel will have to acknowledge this. God's summary of the results of this destruction or this. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations. And they will know that I am the Lord. They will know. Reminds me of the scripture, every knee will bow. You know, every knee will bow. You can bow under your own power or you can bow, bow under his power. God will be glorified and sanctified. Sanctified simply means to be set apart as the true God. In the sight of the nations due to this miraculous event. So Psalm 121, 4 through 8. Pastor Sam, would you read that? Yes. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Amen. The Lord is your shade and your right hand. Yeah. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore. I love that um, that uh, chapter, that scripture, Psalm 121. You know, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber or sleep. He's your keeper. He's your shade at your right hand. The sun is not going to bother you nor the moon. He'll, he's going to protect us. I wanted to end 38 with that. We're getting ready to go into 39. And, uh, but I just love that scripture. And I thought that would make a beautiful ending to that chapter. So in Ezekiel 39, remember we're doing 38 and 39. Will America soon abandon Israel? And the Jewish people. What do you think? What do you all think? From what you've seen on the news, from what you've read in the Bible, where where do you think America uh, is fitting into this as far as Israel is concerned? Anybody want to comment? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, America is not mentioned by name in the uh, prophecy at all. You know, like we have talked about before. Will they abandon Israel? Will they abandon Israel? They are not really a friend. See, I look at people as a friend who will be there with me all the time, every time I am needed. But half the country now has already, in their mindset, abandoned Israel. Will the leadership abandon Israel? Not that the right people are in office, they will not abandon Israel. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone else? How do you think this is not going? Well, we know how it's going to ultimately end, but in the, let's say the near future, you know, uh, how do you think uh, America and Israel's relationship is going to go? Will it get better or will it get worse? I mean, this is... This I is, think it just depends on who's in office, as Pastor Sam says, because right now, America is not standing with Israel. Right. So to me, it depends on what whoever it is that gets in the office depends on the continued relationship or non-relationship with Israel. Right. And Miss Kamala has made made it very known. Oh, yes. Where she stands. Yeah. That's what I was thinking, too. Whoever. So they was telling, let me say this, when they was telling Israel to stop the war, when they were ending the war, that was kind of halfway abandoning Israel. They did mm -hmm. not need to stop. They need to go ahead on and finish the fight. Mm -hmm. You know, finish taking out the enemy. When you got your enemy on the ropes, 
You don't stop and let him regroup and come back and fight you again. And that's what America is constantly telling him. Mm -hmm. uh, this, well, first of all, uh, Israel is not the one that started this. Right. So they're always telling Israel, go to the table and talk. They don't want to talk. Not Israel, Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran. They don't want to talk. They don't want to talk, but but the emphasis is always put on Israel. Try to try to make peace with them. Try to do, you know. And that's why Netanyahu said, I'm here to set the record straight. You know, we're not backing down. We're on a mission. They came in and disrupted the lives of all of these people who are minding their own business, going to work and taking care of their family just like everybody else. And Israel was taking care of the people in that town where those where the enemies came from. Oh, and speaking of that, mm -hmm. you know, oh, uh, speaking of taking care of them, food to the people of Hamas uh, in the Gaza in, in the uh, Gaza Strip, where the fighting were was and where the uh, uh, Hamas drug all of those people. Okay. And there were innocent people. You know, they just got caught up in, in, in their people's mess, but they weren't necessarily, um, you know, in tune with this war. They're just, you know, they just got caught up in it. And, but Israel uh, had felt some type of responsibility to help those people. Mm -hmm. You know, because of uh, between the war, uh, with the war, we've destroyed where you live. So uh, they've been sending food in. But guess what? Hamas has been taking that food and selling that food, giving none or very little to those people. And that's how they've been um, financing their war with the money that they make off of the food that Israel has been sending into Gaza, into uh, Gaza. Now that's really love, right? But that, that they could care less about their people. They could care less about them. You know, they just use their houses to hide their weapons and and uh, uh, same with Hezbollah. They're using those innocent people to hide weapons. And uh, they even showed where uh, people who have garages and things like that, they hide tanks and things like that. And uh, the other day, I think um, they had Israel did a strike in, in uh, uh, Hezbollah and hit six of those residents. But, but before they did that because they knew all kind of ammunition and tanks and stuff had been hidden out in these people's houses you know schools places that you know you think why would you think tanks why would you hide tanks in places like that and bombs and ammunition and everything they used but Israel found out about it and they bombed them but first, before they did that, they sent out all kind of warnings. Get out. Get out. We're going to do. They told the people what they're going to do. So Israel was caring about the people that their own people didn't care about. They told them, we're getting ready to uh, take down the places that uh, have been known to house, you know, these weapons and tanks and everything. So get out of the way. Go to go south, you know, go south, and uh, until this is over. So they tried to get the people out, but they bombed them, they flattened those places. So, anyway, um, uh, uh, Ezekiel 39. Okay, so we saw in the first study of uh, Gog and Magog invasion that the Bible predicts an end time alliance. Between Russia, Iran, Turkey, 
along with some other countries that will come against Israel in the last days leading up to the return of Jesus. As they cover the land like a storm, it will look like a sure thing when for the invading forces. A sure thing that is until God steps in. So we saw also in the first part of the study that God will not allow this invading force to prevail, but will supernaturally wipe them out on the mountains of Israel in, a, in an event that will literally leave an unbelieving world gasping. And it will, the Bible says, be an event that will be used by God to make his name known again to both Israel and the nations of the world. The world will finally know that he is God. He's going to make his, you know, his name great. And people will know and they will bow. So chapter 39 basically expands on his defeat at the war of Armageddon. Uh, two other scriptures, Revelation 16, 16 through 21, and also 19, 17 through 21 are very uh, important. You know, in this study, we're going to take a look at that, these um, to go along with chapter 39. 39 of uh, Ezekiel. So, uh, Pastor Sam, would you read uh, these for us, uh, Revelation 16? Yes. And they gathered together, gathered them together to a place to call in Hebrew, it's called Armageddon. Seventh bowl, the earth utterly shaken. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl unto the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thundering and lightning, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men was on the earth. Wow, that's going to be an earthquake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now the great city was divided into three ports, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. All right, we read this, I can imagine. Each hillstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hell, since that plague was exceedingly great. And then Revelation 19. Okay. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that flew in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the king of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. A little bit more. And I said, okay. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. 
Okay, so those two chapters, uh, 16 and 19, talk specifically about the war of Armageddon, how it would go down, how it will end. Um, I mean, it's just terrible. It's just terrible. Uh, Pastor Sam, you, you had mentioned the talent of the hailstones. The weight of the talent is about 100, I think it's 129 pounds or something like that. So each hailstone weighed about 129 pounds. And uh, so fire and brimstone and, um, you know, it's just going to be terrible. But that's the final war. And the final war, uh, we did see that area. Right. Where the, yeah, where the, the war of Armageddon will be, uh, will be, uh, fought and, and uh in in Israel. So it was just amazing to stand there and look over there in that area that you know is going to be where this final battle will go down. So with that in mind, uh we'll go into chapter 39 of Ezekiel. Okay, I'll I'll give your mouth a rest, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Ezekiel, I like I love this anyway. Okay. And okay. thirty nine one, and you, son of man, prophesy against God and say, "Thus says the Lord God: Behold, I am against you, O God, the Prince of Rosh, Belak, and Tubal, and I will turn you around and lead you on." Bring you up from the far north, like Pastor Ivan said, that part of Russia, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, and you and all your troops and the people who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field. For well, I have spoken, and that is a great big flat open field that was going to be coming up. For I have spoken, says the Lord, and I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastland. <laughs> then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my name any more. And that's powerful. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of Israel. Surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord, that this is the day in which I have spoken. And it will be done. Yes. It, God it, it will, it be will come to pass. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So in verse one, kind of break some of this apart. In verse one, God is the Antichrist, as discussed in chapter 38. He is the, if we can get everybody to put their, um, their mute on, please. He is the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, meaning he is the ruler of Turkey. Turkey, yes. God says that he will bring a Gog against Israel in verse 2. God's in, uh, invasion is all part of God's plan to glorify his name in the midst of his people of Israel, verse 7. And in the sight of many nations, verse 27. So Israel and every other nation, God, God demands and wants glory for his name. God and his armies are defeated on the mountains of Israel. A great battlefield scene is portrayed with birds and wild animals scavenging over the corpses of the slain. 
you know, mm -hmm. yeah, and that was in verses uh, three and three through five and 17, 17 through twenty. Okay. Now let me let me say this. this is the, uh, we, let me say this, Pastor. We know that it will not be horses; it will be tanks and other things now. But back then, in that particular time, to get the people to understand or when you uh, John was describing the, the army, uh, Ezekiel, you know, was describing the army. He used the term horses, but it will be tanks and weaponries of the modern day thing that would be going on now. You know, right, all right. That I had mentioned that when we started today, mm -hmm. that he saw he was using visions or understanding uh -huh. of, of what. Uh -huh. He knew. If we can get everyone to put their mute on, please. I'm getting some feedback. Check your mute. Check your mic. Um, okay, so let's go on. Okay, so this is one of the end time signs that Jesus describes in Matthew 24, 17, and also Luke 17, 37. This uh, is also described where he taught that the birds circling over the battlefields will be visible from east to west, like the lightnings. There's going to be so many, so many. Some of these things that we read about that's going to happen during the War of Armageddon uh, in the end times, you know, we've never seen any of these things before. So sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around it, you know, and uh, as disturbing as these scene, scenes seem, they're real. And they're going to happen. You know, and God has left his word here to let us know. And with that in mind, if I know all of these things are going to happen, and I want to be... Um, you know, safe in the arms of Jesus Christ whenever this happens because uh, evil will be destroyed. And evil represents everything and everybody who does not follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple as that. You know, we talk about that all the time. You know, you, you, you're either on his side or you're not. There's no middle ground. So I believe all of this time that God has allowed his people to ponder for us to study and uh, seeing things uh, progress in prophecy as we saw them uh, today and what's going on. Keep your eyes on Israel. Keep your eyes on Israel. That's for our learning. That's for our benefit. You know, that that's why, you know, we uh, have his word still, you know. So God will then punish Magog, which is Turkey, with fire. And that was in verse six. The nations will know that Jesus is the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In verse 7 and also uh, in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, it speaks of that. It is the day that God has spoken of. In other words, the day of the Lord or the day of wrath uh, that many of the prophets spoke about. Mentioned in verse 8. Okay, let's go and read a little bit more. 39. Okay. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the javelins and the spears. They will make fires with them for seven years. They will not take wood from the field nor cut down any of the forest because they will make fire with the weapons. Then they will plunder those who plundered them and pilgrimage those who pilgrimage them, says the Lord God. And it will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog in a burial place where they're in Israel, the valley of those who pass by the east of the sea, and it will be obstructed 
travelers because they will bury Gog and all of his multitudes. Therefore, they will call it the Valley of Haman God. Haman God. For seven months, the house of Israel will bury them in order to cleanse the land. <laughs> Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying their enemy. Mm -hmm. Seven months. That's a long time. Well, if it's a million man army, <laughs> with Russia and China get together, to be over a million man army in Iran and Egypt and Turkey and all the other armies that will be attacking yeah. Israel. Yeah. Just imagine that they then they'll start killing each other. If, like the other scriptures that we talked about. So just imagine the amount of bodies that will be out there in that area. Now it looked big when you started looking will. over it, but when you put three or four million soldiers out there, you know, okay. so it's, just, it's going to be covered with blood. Yeah, yeah. Okay, verse 14. 14, and they will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. And at the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land, and when everyone sees a man's bone, he will set up a marker by it until the burial have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. The name of the city will also be Hamona. Thus they shall cleanse the land. Wow. All right, so the discarded weapons of Gog's army will be so numerous, so numerous, that Israel will use them as fuel for seven years after the battle. Verse 9 and 10. So it's likely that the Great Tribulation will leave the Earth's infrastructure in such a state of ruin that things will be quite basic at the beginning of the millennium. The, the burning of the weapons also indicate that Israel will be at peace and no longer face any ongoing military threat. Weapons will no longer be needed. Okay, I want to read this um, scripture as well. Um, as Micah 4.3 says, they will beat their swords into plowsheds and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will uh, not use weapons against other nations and they will no longer train for war. Israel will loot and plunder their enemy uh, who plundered her. It will take Israel seven months to completely gather up the and bury all of God's fallen soldier in a mass grave in Israel. So that is also speak, spoken of in uh, Prophet Micah. Now let me come in on that one. What they could do is take all the tanks and <laughs> metal and make, you know, the trucks, the tanks and all the other weaponry and stuff, the guns and melt it down in a steel factory and make forming equipment out of it. You know. mm -hmm. Maybe that's what they're yeah, doing. I mean, yeah, you know, but he was back then, they couldn't yeah. vision tanks and trucks and armor. And that, so they was just using what they had there. Exactly. Okay, Ezekiel 30. Uh, yeah, triumphant. You're right. Mm -hmm. The triumphant right. festival. And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come, gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I have sacrificed for you, a great, a great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat the flesh and drink the blood. And, and as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, 
Speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come, gather together from all sides of my sacrificial meal, which I have sacrificed for you, a great sacrificial meal on the mountain of Israel, that you may eat the flesh and blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams and of lambs, of goats and bulls, all of them fattling of Bashan. You shall eat fat till you are full and drink blood till you are drunk at my sacrificial meal, which I have sacrificed for you. You shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men, and with all the men of war, says the Lord God. Okay, uh, you want me to read a little bit? Yes, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Got you reading. Okay, Israel restored to the land. I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed in my hand, which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from the day, from that day forward. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hands of their enemy. I gave them into the hands of their enemy. And they all fell by the sword. So according to their uncleanness, uh, and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. So um, verses 17 through 20 are an invitation to the birds and the wild animals to come and to feast on the, the flesh and the blood of the, the warriors and the princes of the earth. And this invitation is repeated. Also, we read that Revelation 19, 17 through 18, which is another strong clue that God's army, uh, I'm sorry, God's war is in the great tribulation and his defeat is at Armageddon. So Jesus also alluded to these verses in Matthew 24, 28 placing it in context with his second coming. All of that comes together. I know some of this is, you know, you're trying to pull it all together, but I'll kind of wrap it up. So therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have uh, mercy on the whole house of Israel. And I will be jealous for my name, for my, my holy name, after they have borne their shame and all of their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemy's land and I uh, am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord, says the Lord. So Jesus is, we're almost done. <laughs> Jesus is defeat of the Antichrist and his army will be visible to all nations and will reveal his glory to them. The nations will know that Israel went into exile as a punishment for her sin and unfaithfulness. And this exile could be their uh, near 2000 year exile after the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. That's another whole big old war. Uh, which Jesus prophesied would happen because Israel failed to recognize the time of their visitation from God. God hid his face from, face 
from them and handed them over to their enemies to be killed by the sword. Alternatively, it could be talking about their end time exile after the Antichrist conquest of Jerusalem, since uh, Zechariah 14.2 tells us that half of the city will go into exile. And God will allow Israel to be disciplined and do measure during the Great Tribulation. Because they have not, they still, they have still not accepted Jesus as their Messiah. But from that day on, Israel will know that Jesus is Lord, Jehovah. And that's also mentioned in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. After the battle of Armageddon, God will have mercy on the entire house of Israel, all 12 tribes. He knows where they are. <laughs> A lot of people say, where's all the tribes? I think God knows where they are. He will be zealous for his name and his reputation. Verse 25, and will regather all the exiles of Israel, including the <laughs> lost 10 tribes to their land where they will live in safety with no one to make them afraid. Then they will bear or forget their shame. And they disappear. God will magnify himself in the sight of many nations for his deliverance of Israel. Verse 27, language that uh, reminds us of the Exodus. Israel will know that it was God who sent them into exile. But now they will know Jesus as Lord and he will regather all of them to the land without leaving any Israelite behind. God will no longer hide his face from them or abandon them and will pour out his spirit on Israel. That's the exciting part. Just as he did upon the church at Pentecost. When the church began at Pentecost, it was an entirely Jewish movement. It was all Jews. Some years later, God re revealed to Peter that he wanted uh, to include uh, the, the uh, Gentiles. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, the apostle Paul pictures the church as in the new movement that joins the Jews and Gentiles into one new group that he calls one new man. And, and by about the fourth century AD, the church had lost most of its Jewish identity. But in the end times, Israel will be restored to pride, uh, to pride a place within, I'm sorry, what was I saying? A place of pride, I believe, uh, within the church. And during the millennium that follows, Think of church, the church, still as that inclusive new man uh, with Israel at its center. Two more little ones. Okay. In the end times, Jesus will restore not only the Jews, but all 12 tribes, tribes of Israel. He will confirm the new covenant with the whole nation of Israel as in Jeremiah 31, uh, 30, 31, 33. But I will make a new covenant with the whole nation of Israel after I plant them back in the land, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts and mine. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's what he's always wanted. If you notice the theme, the theme of what we've been talking about for these two lessons is God always wanted to be restored to his people and his people restored to him. Even to the uh, causing of a war, a causing of people to come against him just so he could show his glory in that war. We might not understand that, or we might say, well, I wouldn't do that. But God knows what, is, what it takes for his people to 
get a message to them, help them to understand who he is, and they will at the end. Okay, and so at that point, the whole nation of Israel will include all 12 tribes. A lot of people think 10 of the tribes are lost for some reason. All 12 tribes of Israel plus the Gentiles. It is the one new man, which the New Testament calls what? The church. Church. Amen. So, oh, like I said, the whole thing is, you know, when you read 38, 39, when you read uh, uh, a revelation beginning in verse 13 all the way to 19, and even, you know, Revelation 22, you get all the way to Revelation 22, where it talks about the new heaven and the new earth. All this, God is trying to pull his people into a position where his name will be glorified, they, that they will live um, the way that he's been wanting them to live the whole time. And he will separate the good from the bad or the, the evil from the good. And uh, that's talked about in Revelation, of course. Um, in Revelation 3, uh, 1, 2, and 3, where he talks to the churches through uh, Apostle John, and he warns them of things that they have to get rid of, have to, and have to you know, uh, devolve themselves of, and, you know, uh, part of his kingdom. And that thread from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21, all through the Bible is Jesus. All through the Bible is, you know, having faith in Jesus, having faith in Jesus, coming to Jesus, um, and God's name being glorified in everything. He, he demands that. He wants that and he demands that of people who follow him. And he's not going to take anything less. So this little stu study that we did in Revelation, in, uh, well, we threw in some Revelation too, but um, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and talking about uh, even what part will America play. We're, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, the next time. But... Um, America is going to be, it's not mentioned, America is not mentioned directly in prophecy. You know, you don't see, when you read Revelation, you don't see, and New York did this, and, you know. But uh, I believe that they're going to play a role, or we're, <laughs> we're going to play a role, so... Any questions or comments? Let me turn this off. Any questions or comments before we end tonight? Either y'all understood well or didn't understand a thing. 